The 2022 Football World Cup has concluded and what a conclusion it was for Lionel Messi and Argentina. It was a dream long in the making. They finally lifted the trophy which their fans had been looking forward for the longest time. But this has been a very interesting tournament to say the least. The first held in this part of the world, in this part of Asia. A lot of differences from many previous tournaments. A lot of controversy leading up to the tournament as well. But the mood on the ground, so to speak, was actually very different from what you have seen in many World Cups so far. We'll be talking about all this with Sidan Tane, who was in uh, Qatar for many, many weeks. Sidan, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, let's, uh, you know, there's a lot to talk about. <laughs> it's very difficult to sort of think of where to start. But let's start from the very beginning, as they say. In the run-up to this World Cup, we know that there was no end to controversy. You know, yeah. There were ish very valid issues that were raised Absolutely. about Qatar's uh, record as far as migrant workers were concerned. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's issue the treatment of human rights, those kind of issues. There was also a bit of pushback against this because of how the Western media was actually covering many of these issues. Uh, they seemed to be far more interested in questioning uh, a country like Qatar while never bothering to question to a question, makes right raise such questions when tournaments were held in their own uh, region, so to speak. But keeping, uh, we talked about that, but from the perspective of fans, from the perspective of what you saw on the ground, how do you see this tournament uh, as, say, would you, would you say it was different from some of the other tournaments you've witnessed? What was generally the mood? Different in, in, in many ways, Prashant, but also similar, you know, when, when these kind of events happen and and the world's media sort of descends and focuses on on one microcosm for such a long period. It's a month-long event. Uh, everything tends to be uh, true and untrue at the right. same time. So, so there's a lot of smoke and mirrors going on. And of course, for Qatar, it has to be uh, understood that this was an exercise in soft power and projecting its soft right. power. Right. Uh, as well as what it's done in terms of building up a media uh, sort of reputation for itself mm. through the Al Jazeera network and, mm -hmm. and other things. Uh, on the ground... I think by and large, because uh, from a, I suppose, safety and security perspective, uh, at least for those visiting from the outside, it is probably very different uh, for people who live there full time. Uh, because the region is so safe and, and so secure and everything is kind of like, like I was just, uh, you know, thinking uh, we are so used to, uh, there's so much militarization around, especially in this part of the world. Uh, for a month, I didn't see, uh, you know, a weapon. It's it's different from uh, how things are otherwise. Right. Even if you look at how uh, so, so the security forces, for example, they're uh, present and deployed for the tournament, how they're geared. It was a lot less uh, aggressive and uh, militaristic than in several major tournaments, uh, what we saw in Russia in 2018 uh, and in France uh, two years before that for the European Championships, uh, where you know riot police are uh, right. like Terminator. Uh, so so uh, no alcohol at the stadiums also seem to uh, have led to an environment where we saw lots of very young children uh, attending probably their first World Cups. Uh, a lot of people from a very different demographic mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Saudis were the largest number of visitors to Qatar during the month because naturally they share a land border and, and things have recently have changed. They're patched up to some extent. To some extent, right. yeah. There, there was a lot of Saudi uh, media criti critiquing uh, Qatar also and, mm -hmm. and the efforts being made by by the Qataris, particularly in the context of uh, Palestine and, and right. what, what it perceived as uh, more symbolic uh, gestures of solidarity. Whereas uh, in, in regard to, you know, talks around the Abraham Accords and things like that, uh, different things happening in the back, back right. channel, back, back room. Uh, and from a footballing perspective, of course, the tournament was incredible, I think. Uh, in a sense, having it at a time when the European leagues, most of the top European leagues are in full flow mm -hmm. or mid flow, uh, led to players landing up at this tournament uh, ready to hit the ground running. Right. Uh, Argentina, of course, took a little bit longer to, to get their uh, engine going and get, get their machine running. Uh, but for the rest, I mean, I, it was uh, the first round of games led to some incredible results. The, the Saudi win. Uh, and Japan uh, right. beating former world champions uh, and all of that. So, so on the pitch, definitely it was uh, a, a super tournament uh, and something that we'll miss because the World Cup will now expand itself to 48 teams. Mm -hmm. So the excitement that is generated uh, because 32 is a great number to right. have uh, in the last round of group matches, 
you know, that will, is something that will be missed. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I think the day before the tournament concluded, FIFA President Gianni Infantino finally reappeared after his opening day uh, bizarro speech uh, to talk, to, to reassure, I guess, us that the idea of uh, 12 groups will be discarded. And finally, FIFA has realized that, that there is some something to having uh, groups of four. It, it makes right. for interesting uh, viewing and a lot of suspense. Mm. So, so, uh, so yeah, so like a lot happened. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm rambling and no, no, it's, from it's difficult one, to, one place to <laughs> summarize <the other. laughs> a mud, a month of football <laughs> yeah. in just a few minutes. Uh, yeah. But Sidan, just coming back to some of those points you talked about, uh, would you say that? I mean, there's one question as to was this one of the best tournaments in recent times? Many people, in fact, have been making that argument. There's definitely an argument to be made that the final was perhaps one of the best, uh, you know, FIFA World Cup finals in recent times. But do you also see? Uh, that difference in the earlier stages of the uh, tournament, so to speak, in, in the in the sense that was there uh, were the gaps lesser in some senses between some of the powerhouses and some of the newer, less experienced, less celebrated countries, so to speak. There were a number of upset results, like you pointed out. Yeah. So how do we sort of understand that in the context of the World Cup? It's a in, interesting one, Prashant, and also a tough one. Um, in a sense. Some gaps are becoming uh, Qatar, of course, wa was the exception to all of this. Uh, their project to build a football team as well as football culture around it has only been partly successful, it has mm. to be said, uh, despite the massive amounts of money that have been spent on this tournament. I think it will take a lot longer for uh, that nation to actually right. build for itself mm -hmm. some kind of a culture around the sport. Mm. Uh, but for, for the rest, you look at Morocco's incredible run to the semi-finals of the tournament. A lot of their top players are, this time, mm -hmm. playing in the top, for the, some of the top clubs in the top leagues in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, so they were able to, and uh, Walid Regrawi uh, came in very recently, uh, he, only about a couple of months before the tournament began, and he patched things up actually between right. the Moroccan Football Federation mm -hmm. uh, and some of these star players. Right. You know, because uh, back home, uh, th there's a section of the Moroccan press that believes that some of players who are highly paid at big clubs abroad don't wear the national team jersey with the right amount of passion and dedication. Right. Uh, it's often a criticism that comes up. Uh, but he managed to get, get all that sorted out and, 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 you know, I think the whole world was uh, watching Morocco and hoping for them to, right. you know, after Spain and Portugal and go on and uh, do the job <laughs> against France. But maybe that was a step too far for this tournament. Mm -hmm. but, but, you know, like Moroccan fans and there were a lot of Moroccans who also eventually uh, made it to Qatar. Their favorite refrain when you ask them a question about how far they can go in the tournament or whether they can beat the next big European team, uh, the, the answer was al almost always, why not? Why not right? <laughs> so, so, uh, so, in many ways, that kind of also summed up uh, Qatar's World Cup. It was uh, the World Cup of, you know, why not? Uh, from air-conditioned walkways, mm -hmm. even though the temperature, uh, desert in the winter, it's not hot uh, by any stretch, at least right. not, not compared to the heat that we are used to. Yeah. But still, uh, all stops were pulled and of course, mm -hmm. uh, at some point, it will have to be assessed what kind of impact this has had in terms of the carbon footprint of this right, tournament, right, massive. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, all of that, I mean, we saw of almost for a month, fleets of cars and buses mm. uh, with their engines just running and air conditioning right, just on right, all right, the time. Right. Uh, and that's just a very small part of, mm -hmm. of course, the overall uh, colossal actually uh, waste mm. that these kind of tournaments mm. uh, generate. Mm. So, so uh, but I guess the reality of it is that the, the, these tournaments are not going anywhere. Uh, if FIFA has its way, they will only keep getting bigger, bigger and bigger, bigger as, as time goes on. Right. Uh, they have proposed now a 32-team club World Cup. Mm -hmm. so, so this is an ongoing battle between FIFA and UEFA to mm -hmm. control uh, global football revenues. Because right. as of now, they only make a profit once every four-year cycle. Mm -hmm. right. uh, so FIFA is very keen to expand its own uh, revenue streams. Uh, they are concentrating on media and getting into that in a big way now. Mm -hmm. uh, so that will become the next sort of right. uh, product as it were. Mm -hmm. So, uh, 
I guess the commodification of men's football is is complete. Yeah, of course. O of that, there mm -hmm. there is uh, no longer any doubt. This yeah. was the kind of flagship World Cup of capitalism, uh, and and there were enough distractions thrown at people who were attending to keep everyone happy. Mm. Uh, you know, and and much of these parts of uh, central Doha are shiny, new, extremely spotlessly clean, far away from uh, the labor camps, for example, where right. many of the, the migrant workers coming from, again, uh, this part of the world, a majority of them, where, where they reside in, in the working class neighborhoods. So many of the fans were kind of shielded from, from that reality as huh. well. Uh, and uh, and th there was some symbolism as well. So a fan park was created at uh, what is called uh, Asian town, where, where uh, in the industrial area where many uh, migrant workers live, uh, at a cricket stadium, <laughs> not surprisingly, uh, where you know there was entertainment and screenings, and, and uh, those who didn't get a chance to uh, watch the games in the stadium, although uh, f at forty rials, which is approximately eight hundred rupees, so about ten dollars, right. uh, several tickets were sold to people who were living in Qatar, particularly working class people. So, so in fact, I was talking to one uh, a mechanic with Qatar Airways and he was telling me how in their company, uh, maybe not all the matches that they wanted to, but those who had interest mm -hmm. were able to uh, secure these cheap Get tickets and I actually participate in right. uh, a tournament that uh, they have built because, and it doesn't happen very often because mm -hmm. more and more because of the economics of it and how much right. money there is to be made, uh, working class people are being priced out of mm -hmm. the sport of football, mm -hmm. at least from, uh, you know, you watch on TV if you right. can afford a subscription, mm -hmm. but going to the stadium is often a bridge uh, too far. Right. Yeah. right. So Siddhant, actually, uh, that leads us to a very interesting point, which is basically that uh, you were talking about how the tournament is set to expand, right? And uh, this is the last with 32 teams. Now, 48 teams seems it's 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 quite a challenge in the sense that such a long tournament will interest, you know, remain. Of course, there'll always be a set of hardcore fans, but you know, will the rates of interest change? But like you said, FIFA is also out to make a, a lot, lot of money out of this kind these kind of projects. Absolutely. But the question really is also in terms of uh, connecting this to the earlier question: hmm. Does this? you know, give a chance for more countries to actually sort of make a mark in some senses because there's always a possibility of upset victories yeah, yeah. of some star players being, you know, given a global platform who might then be picked up by, uh, say, clubs in other places. Absolutely, yeah. So do we also see uh, a 48 country tournament while having its many disadvantages also sort of increasing the scope of Absolutely. What, huh, right. yeah. Na narrowing some of those gaps further. Right. I mean, this is a point that is has been, and rightly so, uh, widely discussed. You have 55-odd uh, countries, uh, the same, approximately the same number of member nations for UEFA, as well as uh, the African Football Confederation, right. the CAF. Mm -hmm. uh, but where Europe gets 13 uh, spots at the final World Cup, uh, Africa gets just five. Right. So, so, uh, and uh, Regrawi again made this uh, statement repeatedly that it's this inequality in terms of basic opportunity mm. uh, that has so far mm -hmm. uh, kept a, an African nation uh, from qualifying for or getting to the semi-final stage right. uh, or even going ahead and winning the World Cup, even though right. some of the top players from around the world, a country mm -hmm. like Egypt, for example, wasn't even at the World Cup. Mm -hmm. It can be argued that Mo Salah is currently one of the best players uh, around. So, uh, added spots for both Asia and Africa right. is something that uh, is part of Gianni Infantino's uh, also his constituency, his voter base. That's where he derives much of his support from. Uh, and it is very much part of the plan. So, so I, it, uh, it's hard to argue against uh, expanding the tournament to include some of these countries. Uh, and I think like we've seen this time to an extent, uh, next time it'll be a little bit more, uh, we will find that the, the Western media or the English football press's argument that you shouldn't have teams just to make up the numbers for some kind of token participation prize, uh, that will not be the case. I think right. several of these teams will be able to compete at the highest level because also their players, like you were saying, are already benefiting from the Japanese coach mm. told us how, for example, the Bundesliga has helped Japanese football get to the stage where it has, of course, how women's football in Japan itself right. has also had a major impact on how the men's team has developed mm -hmm. because they have actually the experience of winning a, a football World Cup, right. which the men uh, from this continent don't. Right. Uh, so, so clearly, there are still some gaps in that learning, and, and you know, Japan 
uh, is someone we'll uh, be following more closely at Absolutely. the next tournament as well. Uh, and a chance for some newbies, outsiders also to the United States and Canada being two examples. Uh, they play a very different kind of football to what many of the European teams uh, tend to play. Canada were, were a really fun team to watch. The, the results didn't go, uh, of course. But again, very diverse, uh, multiracial kind of teams representing, uh, I suppose, a, a good cross-section of you know, people who live in Canada. And, uh, and going out there and playing a quite fun brand of attacking football, you know, right. I think they figured that the chances of them progressing far in the tournament were uh, limited. Mm -hmm. But, uh, they, so they gave their fans something to cheer for and, and the rest of us a bit of entertainment. Right. So I think the gaps are definitely closing, mm -hmm. uh, Prashant, and, and we'll see that hopefully. This is a section of, I think it's still extremely difficult, yeah. uh, no because doubt. It still largely, I think, depends on the fact that many of these players have to end up in Europe Absolutely, and yeah. then be yeah. in the league there for them to actually reach that standard. Yeah. Whereas in Asia and Africa, the local the regional infrastructure, the national infrastructure is not, you know, still has a long way to go. A long way to go, yeah, exactly. absolutely. Uh, I think, and for the, the Saudis, for example, uh, it was incredible how well they managed to do because a lot of their players, because it's again a rich nation, uh, and at home they are given the kind of, uh, you know, prestige and pride of place that uh, stars get, which in Europe perhaps if they were to try to move, mm, right. uh, would not be the case. Right, right. So it is far more comfortable for, for the top Saudi players uh, to, to remain in Saudi and play in their local league. But until those local leagues, like you were saying, become more diverse and have some, of, uh, you know, some talent coming in from outside, more talent coming in from outside, uh, particularly like South America, for example, Africa as well, uh, until then, it will be extremely difficult. They were lucky that they had a month, month and a half mm. As to come together as a team and prepare, something that many of the other teams didn't right. because of club commitments mm -hmm. and things like that. And so, because they, they had been together for so long, they were able to get, right. I think, meet their objectives right, right, for right. this tournament. Mm -hmm. uh, but beyond that, Qatar was a clear indication of that difference in uh, infrastructure and, and, and league strength mm -hmm. uh, that you were mentioning. Despite them being able to spend a ton of money to send a whole lot of their players to the Spanish league, uh, and, you know, they, they, they played there for a little while, of course, it couldn't go on forever. Right. Eventually, they had to come back and, mm -hmm. and return to, I think, Al Saad, for example, one of the local clubs, had 15 players uh, who were part of the national team. Okay. So, 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 when you have that kind of also uh, discrepancy within your own league system, uh, it becomes a lot less competitive and, and in the long run, that does, uh, in terms of a footballing sense, it does more damage than uh, good. Japan is the exact opposite. They have an extremely robust league system. Uh, Arsene Wenger, who is now, uh, some are calling a FIFA stooge, he's the, heading the, what FIFA calls its technical study group. Right. He was instrumental in uh, kind of building the J-League up to uh, the level where it's at. Uh, and and it, it is probably the top league uh, in the Asian right. continent. Absolutely. And, and so uh, I think there are examples uh, for other Asian nations to take from the continent itself rather than always wanting to imitate or copy what the West is up to. Right. Of course, and Siddhant, finally, I mean, I mean, a lot of more things actually, but from our perspective, of course, very difficult to disengage politics from yeah, <laughs> sport. And like you said, this provides a bit of a conundrum because like, the World Cup has now become one of the epitomes of capitalism in all its glory, so to speak. I and mean, we had, say, decades ago, for instance, we had the great Brazilian teams you know, which are also very deeply political yeah. in a progressive sense. Now it's become, you know, a lot of the political messages become very anodyne in terms of charitable causes, mm. NGOs, that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. Nonetheless, it was interesting to see the Palestinian flag so open and uh, you know, widely on display. I don't think in any other part of the world this would actually have worked. Or yeah, it was. Uh, and happily, uh, in that sense, uh, because I think for the most of us, the rest of the world, all we can really do is express a solidarity and, and I suppose put some pressure on your local politicians where that applies. But uh, but it was the one uh, sort of political statement hmm. that nobody uh, stood up against. Right. Uh, we saw some, uh, th there were divisions among Iranian fans as mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. who attended the World Cup and we saw how quickly the authorities moved to kind of shut all of that down. So irrespective of whether you are in support of the regime or against it, all of those flags, t-shirts, protests were completely shut down. 
uh, by the Qataris very quickly. Uh, of course, that has to do their own relationship, exactly. with, uh, right? Uh, but for for uh, for uh, the Palestinian cause, uh, this much was clear that that in this part of the world th there is uh, great support, irrespective of what the government, irrespective of what the governments are doing, exactly, yeah. right? So 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 Qatar, of course, is not a signatory to mm. to the Abraham Accords, uh, but there are still a commu a, you know chats going on. Right. Uh, the U.S. is very much a factor in that region. Uh, and and so I think uh, people attending took the opportunity uh, to to say that you know we are not necessarily re always represented by what our governments decide and many of these governments since they are not even democratic governments they don't represent uh, anyone at all uh, in that sense uh, so so uh, I mean I think it would be a stretch to say that Palestine was the big winner of this World Cup because they have I mean that struggle still very much continues right. uh, but just in terms of the amount of uh, coverage that the issue received uh, people are talking about it uh, or people i mean you saw people from all over the world taking pictures with uh, whether palestinians or those carrying palestinian flags of course some of it is also smoke and mirrors because uh, this whole exercise to allow flights to come in which was uh, ostensibly to allow palestinians to come in uh, attend and uh, participate in the tournament, at least as spectators, uh, that turned out to be... Uh, it did not include the occupied territories. It was basically yeah. so, so Arab, Arab Israelis, re residents of Israel, of, Isra yeah. of greater Palestine. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, it was essentially, uh, at least uh, according to reports and the few people we spoke to, uh, including some representatives of Israeli media organizations, uh, that it was to basically allow Israelis to come and watch the tournament in a part of the world where otherwise they cannot travel. And so that was one of the critiques, in fact, of uh, Qatar's decision that the Saudis made, uh, right. uh, Saudi press made at least, saying that, you know, on the one hand, you're, you're uh, proclaiming solidarity with the Palestinian people, but you're then also making special arrangements for, uh, you know... Uh, right, for, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. absolutely. So, so, yeah, it was uh, uh, <laughs> like... I think, like you probably uh, uh, get the sense, it was a bit of a you know a lot going on. It was overwhelming, uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, a lot. in terms of, I mean, uh, let's end with, of course, your take on the goat debate, as you <laughs> say. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, I do have a take on the goat debate, Prashant. Mm. It is quite simply, uh, again, because of, like of, uh, I guess, our politics and things like that. Uh, football is a complete team sport. Uh, you, it's very, very difficult to have one goat. Uh, and even if you have a goat, often uh, that is not enough for a team right. to, to win. Uh, if, let's say, winning is uh, the objective. Uh, you're talking about that Brazil team uh, from 82, for example, led by Socrates, who uh, kind of... Uh, those were the kind of teams, the best team to never have won a World Cup. It was all, ab it was about how the team played right. as, as a unit rather than uh, what a player did or, or didn't do, uh, as the case might be. Uh, at this World Cup, we saw Cristiano Ronaldo and Messi have very different tournaments. Mm. Uh, it also, so th that kind of reinforced how transient these things are. Uh, if Messi hadn't won this World Cup, uh, would he still be the GOAT? Probably. Hmm. Uh, but, you know, uh, because so much of it is outcome driven, I think these debates also get settled uh, when trophies are lifted. Right, right, right. So, my take on it m is probably irrelevant because uh, I think around the world, some a French friend of mine sent me a picture on WhatsApp the other day of, of, of the world map and Argentina flags everywhere except <laughs> one tiny corner of Europe. Uh, so I think the world has proclaimed uh, right. Messi yeah. as the greatest, at least ma male footballer ever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think uh, he has it in him, the way he's playing, to, to go for another World Cup, in fact. Because, uh, you know, he's changed his game completely and, and he operates at a tempo. Mm -hmm. with, and given the condition that he seems to be in, uh, he operates at a tempo which will allow him to play right. when he's 39 as well. Right. Uh, so, so you know, the Messi story may not be done yet. He's so already not be the last chapter. Yeah, he's Absolutely. already got as many right. goals as Pele, but, and maybe he'll take it a bit further. Absolutely, yeah. I think a lot of fans across the world, especially in Kerala where I come from, <laughs> would desperately be hoping that it's true. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Siddhant, for talking to us. Anytime. That's all we have time for today from the 2022 World Cup. Hopefully, we'll talk to you four years down the line as well. Until then, keep watching People's Dispatch.